Search me, O oh God, search me and know my heart. Try me, O oh God, my mind and spirit, try. Keep me from any path that gives you pain. And The fourth bead in our, our string of prayer beads, the orange one, is for the prayer that says, I'm sorry. Confession. By tradition, Christian worship often begins with confession. The rationale, so I was taught in seminary, is that we should seek to be cleansed from our sins before coming into the presence of our righteous God. Like, if you go swimming, you shower before walking into somebody's house. Clean the residue off. In other words, God sees us as soiled. We are welcome through the door, but no further until we acknowledge our fundamental unworthiness and seek the mercy of God's forgiveness. I don't like it. How many reasons would you like? The obvious one, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here, period, unconditionally. Number two, of course we're unworthy, hello. But that totally, totally isn't the point as far as God is concerned. Grace means that love is free. Number three, well, let me spare you the next 10 or 20 reasons. The final one is the one I found myself pondering this week. I can't remember actually ever feeling cleansed by that prayer or by the words of assurance that followed it. The failures that really haunt me are more complicated than that. They usually involve other people or there's something I'm guilty of today uh, that even if I am forgiven, I go back tomorrow and I'm gonna be guilty of it in the same way because I'm caught in the midst of something that's bigger than I am. To me, it's just, uncomfortable theology and not great liturgy, and I know that some of you will disagree with me, and if you would like a right of reply, that would be fantastic, so let me know. Come, says our gracious God, come as you are. Let's see who we will become together. And thus begins a relationship which will almost certainly open my eyes to sins and failings I haven't even been enough aware of to put them on my list. But love is the first word, and it will be the last word, too. And it's only in total confidence in that love that I can begin to dare to open myself to let the brokenness show. Come, says our gracious God. Let us worship. We begin with uh, the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And if you're here in the church, it's number 16 in the hymnal, Let's Stand and Sing Together.
Let us pray. We come, holy God, debtors to your grace every moment of our lives. Seal our hearts to you. Let your beauty and truth grow in us until people see the face of Christ in our faces. As we agonize over the ways we fail, help us also to know the depths of your transforming power. We pray for your wisdom and guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Danielle, thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you. It's wonderful to have you with us. And a special thanks to Charles Nishida, who's sitting over there being really busy. If you noticed, we've got all our chandeliers back and no wires holding them up, no ropes. Charles oversaw the, the process of the rehanging of the chandelier, was it a couple days ago now? And they've all been checked. So if you're sitting underneath one, you don't need to be afraid. It's, everything's good. <laughs> Last Sunday, we prayed for Barbara Rump, who was in the hospital after a stroke. Barbara died on Thursday evening, uh, so we want to pray our thanks for her uh, and our love, our God's comfort for her family and her friends. The Rumpfs were one of the earliest families uh, to be part of our church. They date to the days when the congregation met for worship at Island Park School. The three boys remember helping to set up the chairs. Um, and they grew up here in this building. Alan made the spindly things. Is that right, John? He made the spindly things on the chandeliers, I believe. Yeah, there's, there's a nod. And Barbara poured her life into this congregation as well. We have Barbara, it's one of the main people to thank for the little free library that sits out by the driveway um, and many other things. Not least that she and Alan were keepers of the memories. So many of our founding generation have passed away now. So. As we give thanks for her life, we remember that it is up to us now to be people who keep that vision alive and keep it clear of a servant church that's open and responsive to the community around. Let's pray together. Gracious God, God of our life, we thank you for our sister Barbara. Thank you for her practical, down-to-earth spirit and the way she could organize us. Thank you for the sparkle in her bright blue eyes and the adventure stories her family tells. Thank you for her love for this church and her life poured into our life together. And thank you for her gentle passing into your welcoming arms. We pray for her sons, Eric, Bill, and Dave, and all their families. Hold them close and give them comfort. Bless their memories to them with love and laughter and heal the brokenness of loss. We ask it in the name of Jesus, in whose life we too live now and forever. Amen. Two Sundays ago, I promised you a visit from a member of the National United Church of Christ staff. Elena Larson oversees uh, volunteer ministries. And the internship that we have here in our church this summer, Anna Shea's fellowship, Environmental Justice Fellowship, has been sort of adopted under the umbrella of Elena's program. Um, Elena was supposed to be with us last Sunday and then her plans changed, but she did come to visit on Monday and she recorded a greeting to all of you. So Charles, if you could push the button, we'll watch that now. Good morning, friends. My name is Elena Larson. I serve as the Minister for Volunteer Engagement on your national staff in the United Church of Christ based in Cleveland. But I just wanted to thank you all. You have welcomed me to the Pacific Northwest Conference this weekend. I got to see two of your facilities. I got to go to In Sidson on Lake Coeur d'Alene, the Camp and Conference Center. Then I got to spend time at Pilgrim Furs down in Port Orchard. And here I've been able to meet with Pastor Roberta and get to know what you're doing here with your wonderful summer fellow, Anna. Volunteer Ministries is all about connecting the energy of the church with the needs of the world. We connect through 
that personal connection of empowering young people or older people to put their time, their gift of time out into the world for the purposes of love and justice. So I want to thank you for being part of that project and I want to encourage you to keep it up. You know, volunteer ministries, you might not see the outcome just this summer. It might be five years from now or 10 years from now. Who knows what God will do in Anna's life? And that's because you have chosen to be dedicated to young adults and to put time and energy and resources into the future of the justice work of the church. So I wanna thank you and I wanna invite you, all UCC folks, you don't have to be a delegate. Everybody's welcome to come to Indianapolis next summer for the General Synod. We'll be back in person. And you are welcome anytime you're in Cleveland, come downtown you can see our new hybrid workspace um, it has a beautiful view of the lake you can see the rock hall and of course everybody in the united church of christ is invited to feel like it's home and to come see us anytime because no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey you are welcome here and this here this beautiful congregation with your wonderful minister this might be your favorite place in the united church of christ but it's not the only place together we're doing wonderful things to create a just world for all. Good, huh? Uh, Anna is worshiping with us on Zoom. Um, greetings, Anna. Uh, she's with her family, I believe, on the East Coast someplace, a sort of a family reunion thing going on. Um, but she's been busy on her computer, so she's been sending us weekly um, sort of updates and, and resource lists and things like that, that, that uh, article in the newsletter for you to follow up various things. I think what she'd want me to say most of all today is if you haven't signed up for the Mercer Island City Climate Challenge, don't forget, the link is there in those emails and uh, to see what your carbon footprint consists of and then she'll be on your case to do something about it. Um, her presentation that she made, it was the first Sunday of the month, is now on YouTube, and along with the, the sermons for the last few Sundays. We got behind, but everything is on YouTube now, um, so have a look. There's a link in the bulletin today to all of our YouTube videos. A week from Tuesday night, we're starting a new class at the church here in the evening at 7 o'clock p.m. Cheryl is going to lead us in mindfulness, both studies and practice. It's a beautiful thing to do on a summer evening as, the, as the, the dusk sort of descends. This place is so peaceful. It's a real gift to your soul to come and, and share in mindfulness together. So that's a week from Tuesday, and then it will run for, I think, six Tuesdays in a row. And uh, warm thanks to Cheryl for agreeing to lead that for us. And then Ginny is here. Ginny is leader of our women's Bible study, and she's looking ahead to the fall. The group is going to reconvene on the Thursday morning after Labor Day. Um, if you'd like to take part in that, you are exceedingly welcome. It will happen in person, but we're working on having a Zoom link as well. Still working that part out. Um, but Ginny needs to know so that she can order you a book. So see her today or put a message in the chat box. I will make sure that she gets it. Those are my announcements today. Does anybody else have one? Yes, there's Barb. Just want to invite everybody to stay after for coffee. We have scones and coffee and tea and a decent sized number of people in the sanctuary today. So uh, there's, there's plenty of food for everybody. So do stay, do stay around and visit. And with that, if you're on Zoom, please put a, a message in the chat box, a message of greeting to all of us. If you're here, let's uh, share a sign of peace with one another. May the peace of Christ be with us all.
Minette. A reading from The Little Prince by Antoine Saint-Exupéry. The narrator in this book is a pilot whose plane has crashed in the desert. And he encounters the little prince there in the middle of nowhere. The little prince, too, has crashed into the desert on his journey from his planet far away. We meet them today in the middle of a discussion about sheep and flowers and the thorns on flowers. This is a serious matter because the reason the prince left home is that he was troubled in his relationship with a, a very special flower. As usual, the prince is asking questions. Every adult here knows how annoying that can be. So every adult here probably also carries the regret for conversations with a child that ended up like this one. The thorns, what use are they? I was very busy trying to unscrew a bolt that had got stuck in my engine. I was very much worried, for it was becoming clear to me that the breakdown of my plane was extremely serious, and I had so little drinking water left that I had to fear the worst. The thorns are of no use at all, I said, distracted. Flowers have thorns just for spite. Oh. There was a moment of complete silence. Then the little prince flashed back at me with a, a kind of resentfulness. I don't believe you. Flowers are weak creatures. They are naive. They reassure themselves as best they can. They believe that their thorns are terrible weapons. I did not answer. At that instant, I was saying to myself, if this bolt still won't turn, I'm going to have to knock it out with a hammer. Again, the little prince disturbed my thoughts. And you actually believe that the flowers? Oh, no, I cried. No, 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 I don't believe anything. I answered you with the first thing that came into my head. Don't you see? I am very busy with matters of consequence. He stared at me, thunderstruck. Matters of consequence. He looked at me there uh, with my hammer in my hand, my fingers black with engine grease, bending down over an object which seemed to him exceedingly ugly. The flowers have been growing thorns for millions of years. For millions of years, the sheep have been eating them just the same. And is it not a matter of consequence to try to understand why the flowers go to so much trouble to grow thorns, which are never of any use to them? Is the warfare between the sheep and the flowers not important? Is this not of more consequence than bolts and hammers? And if I know I myself one flower, which is unique in the world, which grows nowhere but on my planet, which, but which one little sheep can destroy in a single bite some morning without even noticing what it is doing, uh, you think that is not important? His face turned white and then red as he continued. If someone loves a flower of which just one single blossom grows in all the millions and millions of stars, it is enough to make him happy just to look at the stars. He can say to himself, somewhere my flower is up there. But if the sheep eats the flower in one moment, all his stars will be darkened. And you think that is not important? He could not say anything more. His words were choked by sobbing. The night had fallen. I let my tools drop from my hands. What was momentous now about my hammer, my bolt, or thirst, or death? On one star, one planet, my planet, the Earth, there was a little prince to be comforted. I took him in my arms and rocked him. I said to him, the flower you love is not in danger. I will draw you a muzzle for your sheep. I will draw you a railing to put around your flower. I will... I did not know what to say to him. I felt awkward and blundering. I did not know how I could reach him, where I could overtake him and go on hand in hand with him once more. It is such a secret place, the place of tears.
And from Luke chapter 18. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. I don't envision anybody taking this string of beads and sitting down with it every day and going through all 10 kinds of prayer all in one sitting, every single bead and what, uh, what each calls us to do. Maybe that would be good f a good thing for you, if so, by all means. But my guess is that more likely on any given day, there will be two or three of the kinds of prayer that really call to us, that, that really grab hold of us. Um, and others will sit in the background and wait for another day. Um, over time, like that, um, they all will have their, their way with us, but not probably all at the same time. Certainly that's how I see the orange bead, the prayer that says, I'm sorry. Some days that will be the first, the only prayer. But if it merges into the background, sometimes that's okay. I'm not very interested in the kind of regime that, sets, that has you sitting there thinking, I, I know I'm supposed to confess now. I must have done something that I need to confess about. What can it be? And you're scanning your day for some bad uh, behavior or when you're driving, or maybe you left that wet sponge in the bottom of the sink when your partner has told you over and over again how disgusting that is, and you should wring it out and put it where it belongs. Um, we are all guilty of petty things but the orange bead is not for pettiness. And it isn't, it isn't for going out looking for things to confess. It's for those times when confession is what our souls need because who we're being is not who we know we are and we want to find our way home. I'm sorry, I am so, so sorry. One of my clergy heroes is a woman named Molly Basquette. She's now the senior minister at First Congregational Church in Berkeley, but some of us read her book about the church that she led in Massachusetts. That church looked kind of hopeless when she arrived. They'd been declining for years, but under her leadership, it filled up with millennials and families with children, hordes of children and students. How did they do that? Well, we read her book, and we tried out some of her strategies here. Molly says people would ask her, what's your secret? And what was the one thing that really, really made a difference? So she'd tell them about their presence on social media or about the street fair that they held in their parking lot. Sounds familiar, I hope. But she says, if we had to name the one practice that really drew people into the church and into faith, it was confession. And by that, she doesn't mean the perfunctory prayer thing at the beginning of every service. The tradition already established in that congregation when she arrived was that every Sunday, somebody would be designated the worship leader. And one of the things that entailed was getting up in front of the congregation and telling a story about a time when they really screwed up, something that they were ashamed of. It was a serious responsibility. Um, so draft one of that speech had to be in Molly's hand by the Thursday night before the Sunday. And then she would work with the person so that they didn't wander off topic or talk too long or avoid the real nub of the story or try to hook the congregation into fixing them. 
it was not the point of it uh, for the congregation to minister to them, but for them to minister to the congregation. Kind of testimony practice. Here's what I did, here's what happened, here is what I've heard God saying to me. Really vulnerable, huh? But it helped the congregation break through that facade where everybody thinks everybody else is fine, they're the only one who's messed up. And no matter what sin or failing uh, the person standing up front might confess, there would always be somebody in the congregation who was struggling with the same thing. So the message every Sunday was, nobody here is perfect. We are real people with real faults and failings. Forget putting on a shiny exterior. Let's just be real with each other because God is here. God is gracious and forgiving with power for healing and starting over. Not that we have that part perfect either, but here are some real stories we have to tell. The number one thing that led to the revival of that church was that practice. Kind of like Jesus' parable being brought into the 21st century. We all know the kind of Christianity that says, thank goodness we aren't like those other people. Moralizing, judgmental, huh? superior. That's the reputation that we have pretty far and wide. Dishonest, hypocritical versus the honesty and soul searching that allow God to transform us from the inside out. At our best, maybe we know something like the fearless moral inventory that our AA friends talk about. No more hiding, especially from yourself. No more leading a double life. Tell the truth. Make some apologies, make amends. If you want to know how Jesus dealt with sin, look no further. He was scathing about self-righteous people who pranced around like they had it all figured out. Everybody else was a mess. But anybody who came to him open and honest was one of the family, no matter what they'd done. Religious people were scandalized at the way Jesus hung out with sinners, remember? It's one of the main things people said about him. By all accounts, those sinners were a pretty savory crowd. For Jesus, that was home. And when he got invited to have dinner with some stuffy religious leader, he almost invariably ended up insulting them and getting himself into trouble. His home is with people like us. And the orange bead is for when we need to come home. Drop the pretense. Admit what's eating away at our conscience, really look at it, say we're sorry. That act is the beginning of reconnecting something broken in us. It enables us to go out and live another day. It may well be that the orange bead sends us out to apologize to somebody. Sin isn't just between us and God. Maybe the orange bead represents the guilt that finally forces us to have that hard conversation with someone we've wronged. Guilt like that is good, says researcher Brené Brown. It isn't fun, it feels horrible. But guilt can drive us to change. We make that phone call, we say what we need to say, and it's humiliating and it's agonizing. And maybe the other person forgives us and maybe they don't but it's healthy. It steers us back in the right direction. Shame, on the other hand, shame is something different. Shame can kill us. Because guilt says, I did something wrong. Shame says, there is something wrong with me. Now, if we could do confession in worship in the church in a way that connected with that healthy kind of guilt without sending us over the line into shame, that would be beautiful. Only too often religion has made shaming its kind of number one activity. Who you are is wrong. You can never be good enough. 
The only way somebody like you can be in relationship with God is because God took your sins and laid them on Jesus and put him to that sadistic, horrific death he suffered on the cross. It should have been you there. So turn the page so that we can all sing together how grateful we are. Yikes. Only we have heard all that before, right? It's what a lot of Christians believe. Brene Brown says that every human being who has ever lived has experienced shame with the experience, uh, with the exception, sorry, of the sociopaths, those people who have something missing in their psychological makeup. We default to shame out of all our disappointment in ourselves. All the condemnation we can imagine coming back at us from other people, how it would be if other people really knew what we were like. So in the face of that, some of us hide behind perfectionism. Others of us just keep our distance and build our armor. Jesus told a story about it. A young guy is headed for home expecting the worst. He was greedy and stupid. He blew a lot of money. He dragged the family name through the mud. Now he's desperate. He's going to have to face his father. And the most likely outcome is that he'll be disowned. Imagining what it all must look like through his father's eyes, it really is that bad. So as he drags himself down the road, he starts rehearsing his apology. He puts his humiliation into words that he hopes will be enough to get him a job with the servants. He's still half a mile down the road when his father spots him. And he doesn't even get to walk that last bit because his father is running, running to meet him. The embrace nearly knocks him off his feet. He starts in on his groveling speech, but his father will have none of it. There is only compassion, only love. That is what God is like. If you're going to be good, be good because love makes you want it, not because there's anything you need to earn. You could never earn what is being offered to you so abundantly, simply for the taking. So don't let this orange bead drive you to making lists of your imperfections and your petty misdemeanors. If you need to grapple with things like that, okay. It's your prayer, it's your time, your life. What the orange bead is for is to remind you of how totally God believes in you, no matter what. It's to nudge you to put your own house in order if there's anything preventing you from receiving that love. The orange color is the hot sun on that dusty road. It says we're almost home, but it isn't an excuse in setting rules and naming punishments. It is about, yeah, the symbolism of it is that crazy besotted father who sees beauty in us that maybe nobody else can see. This is not a license to sin. It's an invitation to let ourselves be transformed by something other than our own exhausted willpower. What we do out of love shines in a whole different way from what we do out of duty. We are born to be people of that light, that hope, that peace. May it be so. Amen. Our closing hymn, Your Love, O God, is broad like beech and meadow. It's number 71. They stand to sing.
May the God before whose face we are not made righteous even by being right free us from the need to justify ourselves by our own anxious striving. May God's compassion surround us, lift us, fill us until our very presence in the world is love. Go in God's grace. Amen. But first, come join me. <laughs> I think we wave to the one right above the library doors. Yeah, Emily, you want to come help wave? There's a camera up there so the people on the TV can see us. That's how they see us. And then you look at the TV and there they are waving to us. Yeah, from all different places around the country, around the world. Excellent. Have a great week, everybody. I'm going to come.